Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, 2020 has been so, let's call it challenging, and it's not over. So we can all use a little brain boost and a little re-energizing, which is why we at Secret Science Club are so thrilled to be working with the Dana Foundation to bring you tonight's amazing speaker, Dr. Wendy Suzuki, on the astonishing effects of exercise on your brain. Dr. Suzuki is a neuroscientist and professor of neuroscience and psychology at the Center for Neuroscience at New York University. Her major research interest is brain plasticity, the ability of the brain to physically change in response to the environment. She's best known for her extensive work in studying areas of the brain that are critical to forming and retaining long-term memories. More recently, her research is focused on understanding how exercise can be used to improve learning, memory, and higher cognitive abilities in us, human beings. She's the author of the book, Healthy Brain, Happy Life, which was recently turned into a PBS special. We are so pleased uh, Wendy Suzuki can be here with us tonight. Please take it away, Dr. Suzuki. Thank you so much, Margaret. It is such a thrill to be here, uh, to become a member, uh, at least for the evening of the Secret Science Club. So what I wanna share with you today is not only something secret, but it really is astonishing. What if I told you that there was something that you might already be doing that had an immediate positive effect on your brain, improving your motivation, improving your positive affect, decreasing anxiety and depression? And what if I told you if you kept doing that same activity, you have the potential to literally change your brain's anatomy, physiology, and function, and protect your brain from neurodegenerative disease states like Alzheimer's disease, from uh, neuropsychiatric diseases like depression. If I told you all that, how many of you, can I see the raised hands? Because I know you, you practice that. How many of you would actually take me up on that and say, yes, I'm going to join you, Wendy, and I'm going to do that. Yes, thank you. See lots of the raised hands. Well, what I'm talking about is the astonishing and transformative effect of physical activity, literally moving your body, has immediate, long-term and protective effects on your brain that can last literally the rest of your life. So what I wanna do for you today is tell you a story, uh, essentially about how I ended up doing an experiment on myself and discovered and experienced the brain-changing effects and the science underlying how physical activity can change your brain. And what I want to end up with is looking to the future, not only what the science is. So I want you to leave here understanding what exercise is doing for my brain and why it's doing it, but also what is the future of our understanding of the effects of exercise in the brain? How can I harness that power for myself? Okay, so let me jump into my slides. Uh, we're going to be coming back and forth. So uh, this will be a kind of a multimodal kind of uh, task. And I'm just going to do that. Okay, great. And here we go. Great. So I'm going to move this back. Okay. So as Margaret said, my main research interest has always been in this idea of brain plasticity. And I just wanted to start with a visual to make sure we're all on the same page, that we understand what that means. Brain plasticity is the idea that, you know, some of us might not have the perfect brain. It might need, need, a, little, need a little work uh, illustrated by this. But brain plasticity is uh, the idea that certain experiences that we give ourselves in our lives, certain experiences, can bring your brain from this state over here to a fully self-actualized brain with all the best areas in the brain shown here. However, brain plasticity doesn't only go in one direction. Other experiences can bring your brain back in this direction right here. I've always been fascinated with that. How could it be that uh, um, the brain can change in that way? And how could I control that? Uh, what, what can I do uh, to make sure that my brain is going in this direction? And I'll tell you the reason why I got interested in this idea, shown right here, 
Um, I had the great good fortune of my very first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate to walk into Marion Diamond's classroom. Professor at, at, at uh, UC Berkeley, can you tell which one she is? As this is before I actually got there, but um, she was not only an extraordinary teacher, the best teacher that I've ever experienced in my entire academic career, but a groundbreaking scientist who showed for the very first time that the adult brain could change in response to the environment. How did she do that? Now remember, this was back in the 1960s. And at that time, uh, the belief was the adult brain, no change at all. There was no evidence the adult brain could change. They actually didn't have the, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, technology to see that. But she did a simple but elegant experiment to demonstrate the, the um, extraordinary plasticity of the human brain. And she did it in this way. She got a group of rats and she randomized them into two different groups. Group one rats got to live in what I like to call the Disney world of rat cages. Big rat cage, lots of toys. The toys got changed out every single day, lots of other rats to play with. And of course, free food and water, as much free water and food that, as they could eat, but big, lots of experiences, environments, uh, uh, tubes to play in and lots of toys. The other group of rats uh, um, um, were raised in what I like to call an impoverished environment. So I Googled sad schoolyard. Uh, so just to give you a flavor, it was a small, but smaller environment, no toys, uh, free food and water, but maybe only one other rat uh, in that environment. And rats are very social animals like humans. They let, uh, she let the rats live in either Disney World or uh, uh, the sad, sad schoolyard for three months and asked, did the brain change? Remember, dogma at the time, no, there should be no change because the adult brain couldn't change. But what she showed is that the rats raised in Disney World, the outer covering of the brain, that cortex, uh, covering the brain actually got thicker. She happened to be a neuroanatomist that could measure that. And that was the first demonstration the adult mammalian brain could change depending on the environment in which it lived. And I thought that was the most fascinating thing in the whole world. I, I vowed I wanted to be just like Marion Diamond. I wanted to study brain plasticity. And so I went on to study my favorite form, early first favorite, form of plasticity, which is memory. Memory, we are forming new memories every single day. Many of you uh, had never heard the name Wendy Suzuki, but now uh, you may have formed a memory and maybe by the end of this talk, you'll form a memory that, that will last a, a certain amount of time. And you might be able to recognize my face or recognize my voice or recognize uh, um, the area of, of research that I, um, uh, uh, that, that I, uh, um, uh, uh, I participate in. So that, that is a change in your brain. And that's happening to us multiple times, many times a day, very, very common. And we know that that ability to form and retain new long-term memories for facts and events is dependent on this structure that I'm illustrating here. I've cut out the temporal lobe. This is a drawing of a human brain where this is the frontal lobe and this is the occipital lobe. I've cut out the temporal lobe here and deep in the uh, burrows of the temporal lobe is this structure called the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse. And you can see up here in the upper right, here is a dissected human hippocampus here and here is a seahorse. So uh, early anatomists uh, um, really named this appropriately. And um, how could it be that uh, I wondered as a young neuroscientist, how could it be that an experience that lasts only a few moments sometimes, let's say your first kiss or the very first time you, hurt, you held your firstborn child in your arms for the first time, that may only last a moment or two, but it creates a memory that could last the rest of your life. I wanted to understand how that worked. And so I, that is, that is what my first area of research was. Um, I would record in the, uh, in the hippocampus and listen to the pattern of neural activity in these hippocampal cells. Hippocampal cells and all neurons communicate by brief bursts of electrical activity called action potentials. And I wanted to decode those action potentials in the hippocampus um, by recording in those cells as subjects were forming a new memory. And basically 
uh, listen in on the formation of a brand new memory. Now that work was fascinating. I got grants on it, I wrote papers on it. I could have continued that area of work for the rest of my career. But uh, about 10 years ago, I, um, uh, something happened that really made me sit up and take notice and um, seriously consider changing my area of research after long, hard years in, in uh, the study of the hippocampus. And uh, that, that event was um, perhaps something that you've experienced before. I gained 25 pounds. I gained 25 pounds trying to get tenure at New York University. Getting tenure is really hard. And I gained 25 pounds because what did I do? I tried to just work 24 hours a day. I didn't do anything else. I didn't have any social life. I uh, ate a lot of great takeout here in New York City. And what was the result? Got some work done, but I gained 25 pounds. And um, my wake up call came when I decided to give myself a, a vacation and I went on a river rafting trip to Peru. And I realized very soon that I was the weakest person on that entire trip. There were 16 year olds that had better, bigger, uh, more upper body strength than I did. And there were 65 year olds that, that were much stronger uh, and had much more stamina than I did. So I came back from that trip and I said, I'm never gonna feel like the weakest one on the trip. I've got to lose this weight. Oh my God, look, I, I'm 25 pounds of late weight, gotta do something. So I went to the gym, joined the gym and somehow it stuck. I went from couch potato to regular exerciser. And um, what I noticed was immediately after just the first class, I walked out of the class, I felt so much better. I felt energized. I don't know how many of you, but, but just think in your mind, if you've noticed um, um, energizing, mood boosting effects of exercise, because that was the first thing I noticed. And uh, this one class that I took here in New York City, maybe some of you are familiar with it. It's a class called Intensati. And it was developed by an amazing fitness instructor here in New York City uh, named Patricia Moreno. And what she did is she combined physical movements from kickboxing, and dance and yoga and martial arts with positive spoken affirmations. And I'm going to stop sharing right now because I wanted to just demonstrate what this workout was that just galvanized me and made me come back to the gym. Now in kickbox class, you would simply punch back and forth, but in intensati, uh, she paired that with an affirmation. So while punching, we would say, I am strong now. And every move was associated with a different affirmation. And uh, I could remember the very first time I went to that class, I felt like a complete idiot looking around. It's like all these people are kind of yelling out all these things. But I soon realized that they didn't care at all whether I was yelling things out. Uh, and actually it feels really good to kind of declare these positive affirmations. And so by the end of the class, I was yelling out just as loud as everybody else. And I left that class so energized. I said, I can't wait to come back. I can't, I can't wait for the next class. And that was the start of my, my fitness journey. So as I said, the first thing I noticed, even after those first classes, I was kind of building up my stamina at that point, um, that the, um, uh, the first thing I noticed was, was that mood boost. I felt so good. I felt energized. I felt motivated. But fast forward a year and a half, I ended up losing that 25 pounds, uh, not just by going to the gym. I, I noticed how much uh, pasta I ate and I, I rebalanced my diet. But all those things together uh, allowed me to lose the 25 pounds. But the thing that really made me sit up and take notice at this moment was when I was sitting in my office doing something that I have to do a lot which is writing. Scientists are writers. I was writing uh, a hopefully multi-million dollar NIH grant at that time. And a thought went through my mind that had never gone through my mind before while writing a grant. I was, I was seven years in, eight years in by this point. And that thought was, gee, writing is going well today. I'd never had that thought before. Because usually when you're writing a grant, you're tearing your hair out. You're thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm competing against Nobel Prize laureates. It's, it's a stressful and, and uh, not pleasant experience. And I thought, oh, that, that went pretty well today. And I realized, God, you know, am I just having a good day? But I realized that my writing seemed to have been getting better 
for two reasons. One, I was able to, um, uh, to really uh, uh, focus my attention deeper and longer than I usually had in the past. And my memory, my long-term memory, which I was studying back in my lab, seemed to be better. Why is memory important? I'm trying to pull together my multi-million dollar hypothesis based on details from sometimes hundreds of papers that are spread out over my computer, on my desk, all over the place. And I need memory, very precise, hippocampal dependent memory to remember all those things. That seemed to be better as well. And I thought, gosh, that is just amazing. What is going on? And so being the good neuroscientist that I, I am, I went back to the literature and I asked, what is going on? What do we know about the effects of exercise on the brain? And um, when I looked at the literature, I came across a very familiar face. That face was the face of Marion Diamond because it turns out that uh, she, this is what she showed environmental enrichment, that Disney world of rat cages. It made, as I said, uh, the outer cortex, here's the outer covering of the rodent brain. And these are two lines I put there just to show you the thickness of this outer cortex. That's what she measured as a neuroanatomist. That was thicker, the outer cortex was thicker. Uh, more transmitters um, in the cortex, more synapses, those connections between individual neurons. There are more of them in rats raised in environments. Angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the birth of brand new blood vessels. Do you see these round things? Where's my, right here and right here and right here. These are all blood vessels and they can be quantified. There were literally more blood vessels in the rats raised in environmental enrichments. Why is that good? Angiogenesis, more blood vessels. The brain is the number one uh, uh, user of oxygenated blood in the entire body. It takes up 2% uh, uh, of, our, um, uh, of our body weight, but uses 20 to 30% of the oxygenated blood. More growth factors also were found in the brains of enriched environment uh, rats. Uh, and so uh, this is what she found. This is what I studied when I was in her lab as an undergraduate. Oh, and it also stimulates hippocampal neurogenesis. Hippocampus, you remember the structure that I studied? In fact, you see a beautiful view of it right here. Here's hippocampus on one side, hippocampus on the other side, this whole structure right here, very beautiful. And what environmental enrichment did is stimulated the birth of even new brain cells in the adult hippocampus. In fact, they should be called adult hippocampal neurogenesis. That's what environmental enrichment did. Well, later studies ask the question, what, what part of this enriched environment, this is a schematic of an actual enriched environment cage, what is absolutely critical for all of these um, anatomical and, and uh, neurochemical changes? And my colleague and friend, Henriette von Prague, did a series of studies that showed it's that running wheel. All you need to do is give rats that running wheel and you essentially get all of these effects. So it's not just env uh, environmental enrichment that does this, physical activity, rats running on those running wheels are doing all of these things, including stimulating hippocampal neurogenesis. And I said, oh my gosh, I knew about the environmental enrichment. I hadn't been following the exercise studies, but I thought, oh my God, I am like a rat on a running wheel. Uh, my, my, my hippocampal function, my long-term memory is better and my uh, focus and attention is better, which was one of the most common effects seen in the literature, looking at the effects of exercise on the brain. So that was, uh, uh, that was great. And I'm gonna come back, stop sharing uh, one more time. And all of these things were just so inspiring to me. How could that be? It was, it was such a noticeable change in my own mood, in my own memory, in my own attention including the memory that, again, that I was studying in my own lab. But the thing that really kind of galvanized me to take this very, very seriously was something that happened, uh, um, something personal that happened to me right at the same time as I was noticing these positive effects on my own brain. My mother called one night during this time and she said that my dad wasn't feeling well. In fact, that he had told her that he got lost driving back from the 
eight blocks from the uh, coffee shop that he had been going to every afternoon for the last 20 years during his retirement um, to get home. He, he got discombobulated, he got lost and he didn't feel well. And I knew that was a big problem because spatial memory, the memory for spatial environments is very, very dependent on the hippocampus. And that suggested hippocampal uh, problems. The hippocampus is the, the structure where um, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's attack first, in particular Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, my father was eventually diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And what I noticed in those months uh, and, and a couple of years that followed was that everything that I noticed went that went up in me, that improved in, in me, my focus, my attention, my, my memory, my mood, went precipitously down in my father and made me realize that the thing that seemed to be helping me, that is physical activity, might also help my dad, perhaps even more in the long term. So I started to study the effects of exercise on the brain. First, a little bit, small, small experiments in my lab. I did experiments on my students in, in my classroom. I actually brought exercise into the classroom. I became an exercise instructor and um, had them exercise together with me and realized, ooh, that means they'd be a good experimental subject for me. So I ended up testing them and showing that even a semester of exercise once a week in the semester in highly functioning NYU students could cause and effect. And those studies and the more and more studies that I started to do in my lab um, convinced me that exercise is the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain right now. And so now I want to go over the science that um, my lab has shown that other labs around the world have shown that show us exactly how exercise is working to improve our brain function. So let me go back to the, uh, my slides. Okay, so here is the human brain. This is a lab, this is a brain that I keep in my lab. Her name is Betty. She is the most uh, photographed brain in, uh, on the island of Manhattan, I, uh, uh, I believe. And I, um, uh, I couldn't, share her today, uh, but uh, I brought a picture of her. And um, here I'm just pointing out the two key areas of the brain that I am going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Number one, you know, the hippocampus. Uh, actually, as you know, you can't see it from the surface, but I'm pointing towards uh, its location deep in the temporal lobe again. Area number two, the prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead. Um, this is the prefrontal cortex critical for so many different functions, including your ability to shift and focus your attention, including decision-making, including um, personality, including what has been called executive functions of your brain, that is the ordering of, of your day, your ability to, um, uh, to do things in order in a strategic way. Why am I pointing out these two areas? These are two areas that are targeted for the benefits of exercise. Also, very interestingly, as we'll get back to at the end, these are the two areas that uh, are also most susceptible to aging and neurodegenerative disease states like Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so let's get to the science. What are the transformative effects of physical activity on the brain? There are three of them. There are immediate effects, long-term effects, and protective effects. So let me start with the immediate effects of exercise on the brain. And here I'll point to a review article um, on the, uh, uh, the acute or immediate effects of exercise on mood, cognition, and neurophysiology that a very talented postdoc Julia Basso and I did a couple of years ago. And uh, my favorite, uh, and actually, if you go to my website, wendysuzuki.com, you can, you can download a copy of this, of this review. And I'll just highlight my favorite figure from this entire review, which is this table that shows you all of the neurochemicals that change immediately, that last for up to 120 minutes after, after exercise. And I'm gonna highlight two areas. Let's go down here. Um, to neurotransmitters. What neurotransmitters are changing uh, right after um, you exercise? 
what you see is increases in dopamine levels, in norepinephrine levels, in serotonin levels. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these neurotransmitters. They are the good mood, the reward feeling neurotransmitters. These are the neurotransmitters going up that are, uh, that are underlying that good feeling, that energized feeling, that positive affect, and even that motivation that you feel after your workout. But the other one that I'm gonna highlight is right here under the category of neurotrophins. What is a neurotrophin? A neurotrophin is um, a uh, neurochemical that helps with the growth and um, repair uh, and sometimes development of the brain. And one of the neurotrans uh, neurotrophins that we know the most about is this one that goes up a lot right after exercise called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, uh, it has been called the uh, miracle grow of the brain. Uh, it's critical during development. But this is the neurotrans, uh, this is the neurotrophin that is critical to help those new hippocampal cells grow um, that is underlying that hippocampal neurogenesis. So how, how can I help you remember this? Well, what I like to say is that even a single workout, it's like giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath of neurochemicals. What do I mean? Uh, about those neurochemicals, I mean, it's giving your bubble bath, giving your brain a bubble bath of, of the serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, and growth factors in there. And what is that doing for you uh, immediately? It is improving your mood, significant mood improvements. It is improving your focus and attention. This is not long-term changes. These are uh, more transient changes. But, but um, we have shown and many other people have shown that right after exercise, you have, you get a nice boost of your ability to focus your attention. And finally, reaction time. Of course, uh, the brain is controlling everything we do, including our movement. And the more you move your brain, uh, uh, the better your, your motor functions become. Uh, by reaction time, I mean that your ability to respond to cognitive tasks gets faster. Um, and so we see that with uh, immediate effects of exercise. But that's not the only, that's, that's only what you get immediately. What about the long-term effects of exercise? And here is where we get down to uh, some of those principles that Marion Diamond first demonstrated about the effects of enriched environments that included exercise on the brain. We know that long-term changes in exercise, that is exercise that is done to uh, maintain and, and improve your cardiorespiratory fitness. That is the kind of exercise that has the potential to literally change your brain's anatomy, physiology, and function. And where is it changing it? It's changing it in these two brain areas, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Now, if you take away only one thing from this entire talk, take this away. Exercise is uh, increasing those growth factors every single time. And those growth factors that go up in your brain, that in the long term is what is eventually stimulating the birth of these brand new hippocampal cells. Now, I don't know about you, but I want as many shiny new hippocampal cells in my hippocampus right now as I can get. Why? Because they work better than the old hippocampal cells that have been there since you were born. They get incorporated into memory circuits better. They are uh, more excitable in a positive way. And uh, they help improve your memory. And um, they don't pop up like mushrooms. So it's not like after every single workout, you can see the effects of, of new hippocampal neurogenesis. But what happens is that that increased level of growth factor that you get after every workout is uh, increasing the kind of baseline level of growth factor in the hippocampus that will then stimulate even more hippocampal neurons to grow. So what I'm saying is regular workouts will literally help you grow shiny new hippocampal cells in your hippocampus. If you want better memory, uh, if you want to uh, um, uh, um, have, have the kind of strongest hippocampus as you can, that is the secret right there. This is a secret science club. That is your secret. But that's not the only brain area. 
that we get some extraordinary change. The prefrontal cortex, now not new neurons, new neurons are not growing in the prefrontal cortex. There is evidence that support cells, glia cells are, are growing with exercise in the prefrontal cortex and that there is expansion possibly of new synapses in the prefrontal cortex with uh, increased exercise. And it's likely that some of the other growth factors that are increasing with exercise may be helping that um, improved prefrontal cortex uh, um, kind of size. There's, there are volume changes in the prefrontal cortex and there's clearly functional changes. Long-term exercise improves attention uh, ability uh, dependent on the prefrontal cortex and improves a range of different hippocampal dependent memory tasks. Okay, so I can tell you all this, but let me walk you through a study uh, that we're just writing up right now to give you a flavor of um, what, how much exercise you need to see these, these effects. So this is a study that I did in collaboration with a great uh, spin studio uh, here in New York City called Swerve. And what we did is we got a group of about 24 to 30 people. We gave them a range of cognitive tests and measured their EEG um, uh, at the beginning of the study. And these were low fit people between the ages of uh, uh, 30 and 50. And um, for these low fit people that were not working out more than uh, one hour a week, we asked them to do three sessions a week of Swerve for 12 weeks. And then after that, we came back and tested them cognitively. Now, Swerve is great because they have a great motivational tool. You come in and you uh, join the red team, the green team, and the blue team, which are bikes in different parts of the room. And um, what they're able to do is estimate your caloric output for everybody on the red team, green team, blue team. So they could estimate the average caloric output, the average, you know, um, power that they're putting out for each team. So it's not like they have to single you out and say, you know, Wendy Suzuki, bike 24, come on, uh, uh, spin those legs a little bit faster. No, they could, they can say, come on, blue team, you're just two points behind green team, just cycle more. And it's, it's really, um, really motivating. So, so we needed a control group that had that kind of friendly competition. So we settled on competitive video scrabble. So our control subjects came into the lab and competitively played video scrabble with our, uh, my amazing undergraduate uh, research assistants. Also low fit people, uh, same amount of time, three times a week for 12 weeks. And then after that 12 weeks, they got free classes at Swerve, which was very nice. So our first big finding, spin class really increases your heart rate much more than um, competitive video scrabble. And so here is heart rate here. And so yes, our, our spinners were working really hard. That was clear. And our, um, our scrabble So what did it do cognitively? So mood, mood uh, um, increased. So this is baseline mood before the exercise or video game playing and after. So we see baseline mood, positive affect increased in the exercise group relative to the control group, okay? So mood is improving, positive affect is improving. What about body attitudes? It turns out that if you are low fit and you, you get yourself to a spin class three times a week for 12 weeks, your body attitude uh, is significantly better than if you go and play video Scrabble. So that was good. Um, what about uh, motivation to exercise? It turns out exercise improves motivation for more exercise. So there was even higher, uh, um, there, there was significantly higher exercise motivation in the exercise group after the intervention than the, uh, than the control group. Attention, I told you that attention uh, in fact was um, um, one of the most common uh, effects in the literature. And what we find is um, there was a decrease, sorry, this is not uh, attention performance. This is reaction time on those tasks. 
So they uh, showed, uh, the exercisers showed a significant decrease in the time uh, that it took for them to respond correctly to these attention tasks, which, um, uh, which suggests a, a, better, uh, a better attention ability. Recognition memory dependent on the hippocampus. So you might be thinking, oh, well, where's all the memory effects? Well, we found two. So the recognition memory scores of our exercise group went up significantly relative to the control group. Recognition memory is memory um, that allows you to say, yes, I've seen that before. Maybe not lots of all the details about where and how and what time of the day you saw it, but that you're able to recognize something, a very, very common uh, fundamental form of memory. And as I said, spatial memory is highly dependent on the hippocampus. What we saw, saw is, uh, again, an improvement in your speed, in your ability to respond to the spatial memory questions. Again, this is the form of memory that we noticed in my father that, that went down so quickly um, uh, when, when he was diagnosed with, with dementia. So those are the long-term effects that one sees. Um, you might ask, well, what is, um, um, what is the minimum effect, uh, uh, the minimum amount of work we need to do to get these effects? Because this is three times a week uh, they were going to uh, spin class. And we're going to get back to that question. Okay, what I want to end with is the idea that um, what I want to end with is the protective effects of physical activity on your brain. I just told you that long term changes in physical activity can change the anatomy, physiology, and function of the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. I also told you that the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, remember where they are right here are the most susceptible to aging and neurodegenerative disease states. So the idea here is that exercise is not curing dementia in any way, shape or form. And it's not literally rolling back the hands of time, but what it is doing, it is shoring up the function, the size, the strength of two brain areas that we happen to know are very susceptible to aging. And that suggests that long-term exercise, not just over a month or two, but over your lifetime can protect your brain from aging. You'll eventually do it, but, but because your hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are larger and stronger, it will take longer for aging or Alzheimer's disease to start to show behavioral effects. Is there evidence for that? Here's my favorite example. Now, these kinds of studies, it's hard to do a randomized control study over so many years, but this is one of my favorite longitudinal studies. It was done in Swedish women, and it was a 44-year follow-up study. So in the study, in the 1960s, they, um, they identified a group of about 240-year-old um, women. And they determined whether they were low fit, mid fit, or high fit in the 60s. And then 44 years later, uh, they followed up and they asked what happened to them. Did they get dementia? How, uh, what, what, at what time did they get dementia? And what this study showed is that relative to the low fit, uh, low fit women in the 1960s, the women that were high fit in the 1950s staved off dementia by an, uh, an average of nine years more. Now that is extraordinary. And, um, but it is also in the, in the absolute direction of all of the evidence that we have uh, for what exactly physical activity is doing for your brain. Okay, so take homes. I have three. Every single workout that you do, moving your body, uh, um, gives your brain a bubble bath of beneficial neurochemicals. Number two, moving your body regularly will help you grow shiny new brain cells in your hippocampus. And three, moving your body is like a shield that protects your brain, including not just the hippocampus, but the prefrontal cortex from aging and neurodegenerative diseases. And now I wanna to get to the $64 million question, which also takes us to the future. Where is the future of this work going? That $64 million question is what is the most effective form of exercise that will maximize my brain function? 
Okay. So I know you're thinking, well, you know, you got that swerve study. Maybe I don't like spin. Just tell me what I have to do. Is there any individualization of this? What kind of workout is good? How long do I have to do it? Does it, uh, um, does my brain uh, effect is the same as my friend or my daughter's or my husband's brain effect? And so these were the questions that I was fascinated uh, to address. And especially those individualized questions were not the questions that I could answer in an NIH-based study. But I thought, well, I have all the tools to create a platform so that I could bring that information to people. And so I've created a company called BrainBody that, that um, is, is, has created a platform to be able to measure uh, the effects of even a single workout and start to provide recommendations. Okay, so what does it do? Um, users take a two minute brain assessment before and after a favorite workout. They get feedback on how that workout impacted their brain performance. What do they get feedback on? They get feedback on their focus, attention, uh, energy, anxiety, depression, and hostility. And so brain body is starting to show that yes, there are individual differences that certain workouts uh, um, may be best for your mood and other workouts may be best for your focus or attention. My favorite example um, of the power of exercise comes from uh, an experience that I had uh, just in August at, in my NYU classroom. I didn't do this through brain body, but, but obviously I'm all, uh, this is my, my research area. And so I was asked to give a 30 minute talk to um, our students. And um, what I decided to do is to give a 10 minute talk, then have them do an anxiety uh, um, profile, come back and do 10 minutes of exercise with me and then do the anxiety profile again. Here's what I found. This is a group of 30 freshmen, incoming freshmen to NYU. The first time that they took the anxiety profile, um, they were high. They were not clinically anxious, but they were categorized as high anxiety. We all did 10 minutes of workout together. And at the end of that workout, I had brought them down 15 points in the anxiety scale and they were, uh, they were normal anxiety. And so that, that is the power of, of what exercise can do. And um, uh, that is what we're trying to develop to make it very, very feasible. Uh, this is not something that you can use right now. We're just developing right now, but I wanted to end with kind of the future direction of where that's going. And now I wanna ask a question uh, of you, which is, can you raise your hand? How many of you wanna go to the gym tomorrow? Anybody motivated to go to the gym? Okay, thank you. Thank you for those raised hands. Well, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm gonna give you a little surprise. You don't have to wait to the, go to the gym. I'm gonna have you all stand up because it's one thing to talk about the effects of exercise and another thing to actually feel it. And I didn't mention it because, but I'm also an intensity instructor. So please stand up. We're gonna do three minutes of um, a, a workout so that uh, your brain is nice and ready. For all the questions you are going to you are going to give me okay so here we go we're going to do intensity all you have to do is do what i do say what i say here we go standing up oops can't see me there okay i'm doing an address if i can do it in address anybody can do it here we go okay just shake it out you've been sitting around first move looks like this up, up. move your arms up, 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 up. okay i'm gonna add the affirmation here it is i feel great you say again i feel great you say I feel great. Your turn. Just keep going. New move. Here it comes. Ready? Right. Left. Right. Left. I feel joy. I feel 
joy. You say, I feel joy. I feel joy. I feel joy. I feel joy. You move. You could do it slower. Hook. Hook. Or you could do it double time. I say, I feel alive. You say, I feel alive. You say, I feel alive. Last move, punches. I feel strong. You say again. I feel strong. You say I say I feel Wonder Woman strong. You last time I feel Superman strong. You done. All right. inspired and stimulated lots of questions and let's see dorian yes i'm here and we have okay. some, definitely had some people sending me thank you so much wendy by the way for the wonderful talk and the fun workout and i will remind people that they're going to be able to access this talk um they, they should go to the dana foundation's um youtube channel and i think it'll probably be also posting on their website the fact that it's ready. Now I'll remind people that they can ask questions by raising their hand. We've already been through that a couple of times. So I think by now they know, but it's on also participants. Great. Mm -hmm. And I also have a boatload of them that they've been sending in to me through the chat, which they're also able to do. Okay. So why don't we start out with um, one of these people who sent me a question very early. And we do have a lot of, a lot of people were asking about if aerobic or anaerobic was better. So I think that was sort of answered already. Um, so can I can I actually address that because that's a very sure. common question. I would say the answer is that we know the most about aerobic activity. It's absolutely beneficial, and there's less known about anaerobic activity. There's more and more work being done on resistance training, and I would say that it's not that. Um, be very clear. The, the most research is about aerobic, the beneficial effects of aerobic activity. Just because there's not enough research on anaerobic doesn't mean that it's not good. I think we need more work in that area. But if you want to choose that workout where the most science shows that it's giving you beneficial effects, it is aerobic. That's a, that's a known fact there. So. So Linda's asking, can brain plasticity play a role in overcoming some of the cognitive biases we are prone to, example, in group bias, confirmation bias, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question. I am not familiar with any uh, work in that, in that area. I mean, um, some of the most extraordinary studies on, in exercise uh, really have more to do with mental health and um, um, a physical activity regimen has been shown to be as um, effective as commonly used antidepressants to treat major depressive disorder. But I have not, you, I've never seen exercise used uh, to study um, biases, confirmational biases in that, in that sense. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask Ryan to unmute here and see if he has a question. Great. Hi there. Um, hey, Ryan. Wonderful lecture. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, this is incredible. Um, my question, I'm sorry, I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> my question is, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a practitioner of uh, martial arts, and mm -hmm. I didn't know if there were any studies um, that, that uh, talk about the effects on the brain through martial arts, or if there are different martial arts that actually work better. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there are, uh, there are, smaller studies in the kind of Western literature, um, the neuroscientists tend to use things like, you know, treadmill. <laughs> and uh, however, uh, you know, uh, what we do know is 
that martial arts is a combination of there's some aerobic, there's resistance, there's meditative effects. We also know quite a bit about the effects of meditation, uh, beneficial effects of meditation on mood and, and uh, cognition and affect. So um, the, all of the evidence suggests that yes, uh, a whole wide range of martial arts uh, would be beneficial, but we can't tell you exactly the answer of the, uh, the relative effectiveness of, of each particular martial art. And also um, it will depend on the starting state and the health state of the person that you are, you are testing. Is this a, a martial art master that you're, you're looking at or is it somebody who has just started a fitness journey? And I'll just say that, I'll just add that um, I'm excited to be starting my first Qigong study uh, through Brain Body uh, in January. So we're gonna be uh, looking at that, that particular form of martial art. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here from Lauren who asked, um, are there gender differences in the efficacy of exercise on neurological effects? Also, is there any evidence that the time of day of exercise makes a difference on neuroplasticity? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think that there are some studies, um, I would not say there are comprehensive studies on the effects of exercise in men and women. Some studies say that women benefit more from exercise, but both sexes benefit. And um, in terms of the time of day, again, no systematic examination of uh, the time of day. And when this always comes up, uh, people ask me, you know, when should I work out? And um, I just, you know, I just, I always say that we know that exercise is improving your mood. It has immediate effects of, of on cognition. Um, and so you want to try and apply exercise right before you need that good mood, that good cognition. And so, um, and then I say, well, when do you work out? Well, I work out first thing in the morning because I need to use my brain uh, <laughs> at work in the morning. I also, I, I happen to be a morning person naturally for the, for all of my life. And so that, um, that absolutely benefits me though. I, I must say that for many years, I worked out in the evening before I studied the effects of exercise. I was working out in the evening, uh, because that just fit into my schedule. But, um, I noticed that it did have a better effect on my own uh, mental productivity uh, when I switched my workout to the morning. But, but let me be clear, there are no systematic studies to examine um, uh, the, the effects. And again, I would say that there's two things to keep in track of. People have circadian rhythms. There are natural uh, morning people. There are uh, other people that tend to work better at, at night. So all of those things, um, that would be a big but, but fascinating study to look at. Great. Thank you, Prova Lauren. Thank you. Uh, we're going to ask Daniel to unmute himself and ask his question now. Great. Great. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. My question is about the marginal benefits of additional exercise, whether you've studied the point at which exercising more in a day or a week or whichever time frame um, isn't actually producing any additional benefit neurologically. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And no, we haven't gotten to, we're still trying to identify, you know, that, that optimum. Um, and, and, you know, some of these studies are um, hard to do everybody because everybody wants to sign up for an exercise study, but nobody wants to complete the exercise study. So it's, it's challenging enough to do the first, uh, first study and then say, okay, well, do some more and see, see if that helps. Um, uh, uh, although I, I will uh, relay uh, an anecdote from the work that I'm doing with Brain Body, which is that we have uh, tested a lot of just everyday exercisers. Uh, we've been working with dance classes. Um, but also uh, yoga classes and uh, in, in all of that mix, we ended up testing um, two trainers, they're fitness trainers. And um, they gave the highest scores for how hard did you work out? They're giving tens, you know, when they work out for themselves, they're doing 10. And uh, they had some of the lowest um, cognitive scores of everybody that we saw. And so um, uh, it, it suggests that uh, that's not so surprising. If you work out way, if you work out to your limit, your brain doesn't function very well in these cognitive tasks. That doesn't mean that it's not good for it. It means that you need more recovery time. Uh, so, so there's a lot of questions to, uh, to look at, including what is the best 
you know, delay time between a particular workout that you do. Um, I don't do 10 workouts, for example. I'm not a fitness trainer, although I work out very regularly. Um, and so I know for myself, because I use my own platform, uh, that, that, um, that I, I get benefit, brain benefit from my early morning workouts. Uh, a good sweaty workout for me in the morning will keep me going through the afternoon. When I don't do that, I, I can't work, write a thing. I have to do kind of uh, uh, busy work in the afternoon. So, um, uh, so sorry, no, no answer to your question, but, but that's a great one. Okay, we have a, uh, one of the audience members asks, how does this work with people who have ADD? And is there a metric like cardio rate or respiration that shows what type of exercise counts in producing this benefit? Yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, uh, that is one population I'm particularly interested in. There's, there's just a handful of studies looking at the effects of exercise in ADD. And so the hypothesis is that because we know from so many studies that exercise improves your attention, that it should improve it in these ADD patients. How much exercise, you know, how long, how long does it last? If you have ADD, is it, is it a shorter effect? No, no way to understand. And um, so, so uh, part of what we're trying to do with, with this uh, platform is, is define for you individually what exactly that, that heart rate is for you that is causing your, your optimal brain response. But even if you don't have brain body, um, I'm a big proponent, and, and as I describe in my book, Healthy Brain, Happy Life, of self-experimentation. The whole book was all about doing experiments on myself. And um, for example, I, I could tell, uh, and you can tell, the difference of um, the mood effects that you get from different workouts. Uh, there are certain workouts, and, and in fact, that was why I was uh, um, attracted to Intense Sati. That gave me the best mood for the longest time because it wasn't just the physical activity. It was those affirmations. If you declare out loud using your voice that I feel great, I feel joy, I feel alive, I feel strong, um, that is that has a psychological effect on you that lasts for a long time. And um, but other other workouts, um, my other favorite is kickboxing. Uh, um, seems to uh, uh, give me a particularly long focus and attention, which I need for a lot of the work uh, that I do. So um, yeah, that affirmation effect seems. It reminds me of uh, what people who studied smiles and fake smiles versus real yeah. smiles, and if you could just force yourself to smile, it actually made your mood get better. Exactly. <laughs> the muscles. Exactly. But, yes. Yes. Yeah. We have Mike G who has a question. I'm gonna ask him to unmute. Yeah. Mike. Yeah, have there been any studies regarding the environment in which you work out? Say, is it better to take a bike ride on a bike trail where you have a lot of outside stimuli or is it better to just go to a gym and grind out a, uh, a workout on a stationary bike? Yeah, you know, no. Uh, I, I don't know of any studies that have compared that systematically uh, because it's hard enough to get people again to to work out anywhere. And uh, I think any workout, it, you know, maybe you don't have the trees. There, there, there is no trail. I don't have any trail. I, I'm Midtown Manhattan, so um, I, I work out right over there, right in my living room. Um, thank goodness, because that's the only place I have to, to work out. So um, um, it's it's. Do I think that there's going to be a difference? I think there's definitely personality people that would, you know, that, that hate the gym uh, atmosphere or just will never go outside because they don't like the, the um, all of the elements out there. Um, so I think there's some individualization in that, but, but um, that is a really interesting question for what, what uh, how can we enhance um, the group and our own um, um, exercise brain benefit from exercise. Okay, we have a question from Inna who says, do prof professional athletes have superior mental abilities? What about professional sports? Yeah, you know, um, they, uh, this hasn't been studied. I know there are a lot of sports teams, particularly baseball teams that study not cognitive effects, but um, what's called psychophysical effects, because we all know, or at least anybody that, that follows baseball knows that, you know, those millisecond decisions 
uh, can mean, mean the difference between a, a really, really incredible batting average and a terrible uh, batting average. Um, but cognition has not been studied in these, in these sports. And it's, it's a very interesting question, um, especially if you get into the sports that also include head injury, football, soccer. Um, uh, what, what is the best sport for, for cognition? Um, Olympic athletes would be really interesting. I, uh, um, I, I think that's a really uh, interesting question, but it turns out that the athletes are not as interested in the cognitive benefits as they are, you know, skier, how do I get down faster? Uh, um, baseball player, I just want my batting average to be, be higher. You know, I don't need to be smarter. I just need, I just need a higher batting average. But yes, absolutely, all the work that I, I described suggests that there are uh, definite cognitive benefits for regular uh, athletes or professional athletes. I'm gonna ask uh, Aaron Taylor to un ask his question. Aaron, you can unmute. I don't know if you're there or maybe you're a residual hand raiser from the hand raising <laughs> days. Hmm, okay. Oh, okay, B, B Wade. I'm gonna ask to unmute, B Wade. Yeah, hi. Oh. I wanted to ask Wendy if she's familiar with any uh, supplements or natural food substances that can enhance neurogenesis in the hippocampus? Um, no, I, uh, no, I, I'm not familiar with, with food supplements that have been, that have shown that, no. Okay, and then the second part was in relation to age-related uh, memory loss, cognitive losses, and things like that. Is this exercise the singular best process that one can engage in to sort of um, slow that down or stop it? Yeah, well, you know, I think that um, exercise can help any degenerative disease that affects, uh, that affects memory. But of course, it has to balance against kind of physical health. Uh, if you're going to hurt yourself doing it or, or it's dangerous to do it, then, there, th then you have to weigh that. But yes, brain fog. Um, we've been talking uh, about the positive effects of exercise, particularly, you notice on my list, are, are anxiety and depression. Anxiety levels have gone up 30% uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, this is, again, a secret and, and astonishing tool to be able to address that. Um, and, uh, um, you know, you don't need uh, a, a expensive gym membership. You need shoes and um, a mask to walk, walk around or, or, you know, join a, join a workout online. But um, exercise has the benefit of being able to help with brain fog. That, that is part of the um, frontal lobe improvement and, and memory uh, impairment. So absolutely, yeah. Hey, uh, we have one from Nirav who says, what is the mechanism by which exercise benefits the brain and are there any ways to replicate it without exercise? <laughs> um, yes, so um, uh, we're starting, I didn't have time to go over the mechanisms that we're starting to identify um, because you know, you think about it, how, how is moving my muscles out here affecting my brain? What is that signal? And so we've identified kind of two categories of signals. One comes from the muscles and the muscles um, release a, um, um, what's called a myokine, a protein released by the muscles, excuse me, that goes up and passes into the brain through what's called the blood brain barrier because the brain is very protected in terms of what gets into it from the general bloodstream. And it turns out that that myokine stimulates the, um, the uh, um, the production of that famous growth factor, BDNF. Um, the other pathway goes through the liver and um, uh, there is a ketone body that's released during, or during and after exercise, beta hydroxybutyrate, that also passes through the bloodstream that goes into, um, th that stimulates um, BDNF as well. So um, there are multiple pathways 
all leading to higher levels of growth factors in the brain that is at least one, I'm sure there's many others, but that is the one that is best characterized right now. And that is, um, uh, that is what's happening. So, so of course there are people that say, okay, well just feed me all the, you know, uh, the keto beta hydroxybutyrate. Maybe if I eat a lot of beta hydroxybutyrate, um, I'll get these same effects. Unclear whether, whether that is, is the best route. Um, uh, but I would say that um, there are so many other benefits to exercise. That is the physical part of exercise. Of course, it's helping your cardiorespiratory function. It's helping your muscles as well as helping your brain. So I would consider um, using just the exercise. <laughs> it sounds a lot more efficient, actually. Yes. <laughs> um, Suki has a question. I'm going to ask Suki to unmute and ask the question. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so Hi. much for the talk. Um, I have a question because from the um, chart, I see um, cortisol has a big green um, yes. area too. Yeah. Does it mean cortisol also increase after 120 minutes after the workout? Absolutely. Exercise is a stressor. And um, the kind of ironic, not ironic, but it's um, paradoxical. Uh, thing is that you know you don't want high levels of cortisol that's bad that could you know that leads to PTSD cortisol is it's bad well it turns out that the cortisol that is stimulated by exercise isn't uh, um, isn't hurting um, the brain areas that we know that other stress induced levels uh, that's negative stress induced um, uh, increases in cortisol do. do. Do we know why that is the case? No, we don't. Uh, but it's absolutely clear that exercise, which stresses the body, uh, does increase with exercise, but it does not seem to be associated with the same kind of neurodegeneration that you get with the high level levels of cortisol that you see with PTSD. But that is not a mistake. That is going up. And um, uh, we still don't have an explanation for why isn't that bad? Uh, because it's it's not bad during exercise for exercise. Okay, thank you. Um, Marianne has a question. How do you think your work converges with what we're seeing regarding the effect of the microbiome on neuro neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's? Yeah. So I mean, I think that um, I think that all of that work on the microbiome and the gut brain uh, connection is fascinating. And uh, I think that, you know, it just emphasizes that uh, these diseases are kind of uh, so all encompassing. There are so many ways that you can, you can address them. And, um, it, you know, you look to, I, I think of brain plasticity again. It is how you are living your life can have um, amazingly good or sometimes really bad effects on um, uh, on, on things like Alzheimer's disease. So, so you have to pay attention to how you are moving your body, how much you're moving your body. Or am I letting myself not walk as much because I, I, I'm inside so much more? Um, am I um, eating better food or worse food that, that uh, could affect me for the long term? So uh, yeah, I think I think uh, all of that work is fascinating, and um, there's still more work to do to look at the specific interactions between exercise, the microbiome, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, 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 it, it just shows the 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 importance of of the everything in your life to addressing these these um, big diseases of our time, like Alzheimer's. That's pretty in interconnected. Yes. Um, we have a question from um, Bama, who I'm going to ask to unmute and ask their question. Bama. Um, um, hello. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much for this very inspiring talk. So I'm a scientist uh, myself. I work at the NYU medical campus. My lab studies um, aneurysm. So um, this is um, a little uh, aortic aneurysm. So this is a little outside of my field. But I do understand the stress of the grant writing and the paper submission and the reduction, <laughs> rejections, all that. So I had sort of a, a broader question. Um, so 
I love the feeling I get after exercising, yeah. right? So I think this is well admitted and um, work from you and colleagues have trying or trying to pin down the molecular pathways that ignite this. I'm, I'm just very curious about if this is so positive, why yeah. doesn't our brain stimulate us to go exercise? I mean, if I had to choose between sitting on the couch and watching a movie and going to exercise, but I do know that, that I do enjoy the feeling of exercise, but yeah. why doesn't our brain, what are, what are the insights you have that you can share with us framed that it pushes us to exercise? Well, it, it does. It's just not, it doesn't do it enough. So exercise enhances exercise motivation, but you have to realize that, that exercise in your brain, this thing has, that has been with us since the beginning of time that is moving your body, not, not what we define as exercise now, but never had to compete with Netflix and, and all the algorithms that Facebook uses to, to draw you in. These are um, um, addictive. These are designed to be addictive. Just like, you know, I have a terrible potato chip addiction. I cannot only eat one. That, that salty flavor is just so enticing, even though I know it's not good for me. So I was like, why doesn't my brain, my brain does tell me, Wendy, it's not good for you, but I still do it. And um, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, uh, it's the power of these other social, uh, social tools. And um, we need to just use, and I do this myself, you have to use your prefrontal cortex and decide what, what am I going to do? What do I think is best to do for my body and, and, um, and for my health? And how am I going to kind of live my life uh, to, to, to follow that? So, so it, some of those motivations are there, but the other motivations that are around us um, that affect you and I, and especially younger people, all the students and, and the addiction to the phones um, are, are very powerful and not, um, and oftentimes not, not the best choices. Uh, I have a question from Susie. You may have addressed the one end of this one, but maybe not the other. Is there a dose response? Um, is a certain level of exercise intensity required or is walking, et cetera, as effective as yeah. intensive? Yeah. So um, the best answer uh, to that question is that you don't have to become uh, a triathlete to get these benefits. Uh, you can start to feel the mood benefits with a good power walk. Next time you go to Costco, take another walk around the uh, thing and, and, and start to get that. Um, but uh, beyond that, it really does depend on where you start from. So if I'm talking to a very high fit person, um, walking probably won't do it for them, even maybe for the mood benefits uh, uh, and, and they'll need higher levels of activity. But the great news that I always like to emphasize is that if you're just starting out uh, and you haven't you know, really started uh, exercising regularly, um, you have to do the least to get, to get a good aerobic workout. Uh, so, so don't think that you have to follow the marathoner that's your next door neighbor going out on a five mile run every morning. Um, that, that good power walk uh, will get those um, juices going and get, more importantly, get your heart rate going. So um, it really does uh, uh, depend on, on where you are. And so you say, well, that doesn't help. Um, so, so what should you do? You need to find a workout that that makes you feel like you worked, okay? If it's too easy, it's like, oh, it was so easy. Maybe it was too easy. Uh, do something that gets your heart rate, that makes you feel like, oh yeah, that, that's a workout. I've, been, I've gotten really good at finding those, those workouts that, that do that and do that fast. So I've gone from, gone from you know, hour workouts to half an hour workouts. So I just like to work harder for shorter periods of time, but my heart rate gets up really high. I, I'm gonna step in here and just say, there are a lot of questions and I don't know how much of, uh, more time you have, but we'll continue along the line as long as you, as long as you can do this. Okay, yeah. Quite a few. A few more is fine. Okay, um, we're gonna ask Girish to unmute and ask you a question, please. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Wendy? I can. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, my question is specific to Hatha Yoga. Is there any specific research 
on Hatha Yoga and then even within that, on whether specific asanas help more than others in terms of brain plasticity? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question. And, and no, I have not, I have not done that. Um, I think that's, I'm collaborating with a wonderful yoga um, organization called Warrior Flow Foundation. And um, uh, um, love to start to look at different uh, individual aspects of, of yoga, but haven't been able to do that. And there are general studies on yoga, but they're kind of few and far between. So there's a lot more to figure out in that, uh, in that realm. That said, there was somebody asking how they can take part in one of your studies. <laughs> Well, um, we're not, uh, all of my studies at NYU, uh, thank you for asking, are um, focused on anxiety and depression in um, college students. So unless you're an NYU student, um, we're not taking, um, we're not taking uh, participants. And for Brain Body, we are, we're, we're uh, um, working with different companies and working with the exercisers with those companies. We will, we will eventually be go directly to consumers like you. And so you'll be able to try it out. Um, although I should say that I know the Dana Foundation has a wonderful collaboration with uh, the JCC. So I have two free uh, um, brain body trials coming up with the JCC. So um, if you want to join those, uh, um, please look in January. We'll do one in January and one in March. That's so. good. Good time to put in a Dana.org is a good place to go look and also that this talk will be up on the Dana Foundation's YouTube channel and um, they can access that through their website. I'm going to ask Spiral to unmute themselves and ask the question. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'd also like to give a shout out to my high school neuroscience teacher for telling me about this talk, Ms. Shaw. Oh. But my question is, uh, in your talk, you mentioned a lot about how exercise gives us um, I'll call it like neuro benefits, yes. but I'd like to ask like, why does exercise give us all these brain benefits? I could see many explanations coming from like an evolutionary standpoint, mm -hmm. the survival of the fittest and all that. But what I kind of thought about and what I'd like to hear insight on is um, like right now, the typical lifestyle of people's inactivity and sitting down all day, it's kind of like a self-imposed disability. So as an analogy, if you imagine someone disabling themselves by wrapping rubber band around their wrist really tight, and then when they start to loosen the rubber band, which could be analogous to exercise, you would obviously see a bunch of like bodily beneficial changes. Mm -hmm. So like, why do you think we get all of these neuro benefits with exercise? Well, I do think it's evolutionary. evolutionary. So um, we were designed to move and uh, you, you know, the more you move, the more you're motivated to move and you get all these cardiovascular, you get, uh, uh, um, uh, you get brain benefits, you get immune benefits uh, from moving. So, so we were, despite our state right now, as you uh, uh, eloquently described, uh, we were originally designed to move. And um, uh, so in a sense, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody can get an extra benefit because we are, none of us are moving as much as we should. Uh, even me, I would, I, I should, I should, I wish I had more time uh, to spend uh, to spend moving, but it uh, turns out that writing takes a lot of time and it's hard to write uh, write while walking. Although I do use a standing desk, um, which which is helpful, but but not the same as as uh, being able to go outside and 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 move your body. So um, I, I do think that is it's it's part of what humans were originally designed to. Um, um, to do and, and uh, talking about the, the benefits. Why doesn't you feel the benefits? Well, if we did it more, we would feel more benefits. So uh, part of it is uh, uh, using your analogy that we're just not taking that rubber band off enough and we're getting used to the, you know, the numb feeling that we get because we have a too tight a rubber band around our, our wrist all the time. This is a good follow-up question from Janelle who says, considering that we all likely gained the COVID-15 or more, which I guess is probably worse than gaining the tenure of 25, but um, how do you spell the workout class that you're referring to? How do you spell oh, yeah. that? So it's called Inten, I-N-T-E-N, Sati, S-A-T-I. Inten comes to the word intention. Sati 
means mindfulness or awareness in Pali, which is a Indian language. Um, and so um, there's DVDs on, on Amazon. Um, there are short classes that you can get on YouTube. Really fun, you can see Patricia uh, teach her class. And um, uh, yeah, but it's, it's still my favorite workout. And uh, I, in fact, I make my, uh, I'm currently teaching a brain and behavior class at NYU to 120 non-science majors. And um, we do three minutes of intense sati before every single class just to get me <laughs> excited about teaching the class <laughs> and everybody else too. Okay, great. Okay, so that's intense sati. I did put it in the chat for people to look so they can look it up. Um, we're going to ask Mark to unmute himself and ask his question. Hey, thank you so much for your presentation and for uh, getting everybody up to move. I think that's such uh, such an effective way to get your point across. Um, okay. and it was fun. Yeah. Um, so I am a, I'm a dancer and I also have somewhat of a background in psychology and I'm also really interested in how movement uh, can help us heal. Um, and I have found that... Uh, when we are kind of pushing ourselves and are in um, are, are kind of in exhausted states or are feeling very deeply are kind of very stimulated while we're moving, um, the psychological benefits of kind of reconditioning uh, you know patterns around sort of trauma or um, just whatever kind of negative habits that we want to kind of rewire. Um, are more effective. Uh, and it's like you get a little bit more uh, kind of bang for your buck. So I'm curious if you have any insight around that, uh, which for me is is really just kind of a theory. But um, I'm, yeah, I'm curious if you have anything, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's really interesting. I've not studied that in, in my work. But um, I have experienced it. In fact, kind of the philosophy of this intensati workout is to kind of open yourself up with with exercise and bring in these positive affirmations to see whether you can you know incorporate some of that thinking that positive thinking that that um, um, those those ideas about personal strength into your into your own into your own thinking um, but that's that's as far as as I've gone with that I I've used it. I, I think it's, it's really effective. As I said, it was uh, kind of adding the movement, the music with the positive affirmations uh, for me is uh, just gives me the biggest uh, mood boost that I've ever felt after, after a workout. So, um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything uh, more insights than, than that. See, Nurav has uh, written to me saying the fake smile experiment hasn't been properly replicated. So we'll put that on the record from Nirav. Um, so many more questions here. Okay, um, maybe a couple more. Okay. Uh, how, as a researcher, how do you measure or ask, ex, access BDNF release? Uh, I'm not sure what that is, but. Yeah, yeah. So how do you measure BDNF? Uh, they're in humans. Um, the only way you can effectively measure it is by taking it from the blood. And uh, that is not a direct measure of BDNF levels in the brain. Uh, in animal studies, you can do direct measures of BDNF levels at different, in different parts of the brain, particularly in the hippocampus. So there are, there are ways in, in humans, uh, it's, it's much less precise than it can be in experimental animal studies. Great. Okay, well, I'll take one more here. Uh, JP, I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask a question. Hello, Wendy. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, I, I unfortunately I missed part of it, but but it was very interesting. My my question is not really about exercise, but about two other activities that have uh, related effects. I've I've been reading about sauna use and also about cold water baths. Mm. You might have heard about this guy called the Iceman and uh, both uh, seem to stress the, 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 the body and pr produce some of the effects similar to exercise. Mm. I tried bathing in an ice, ice lake once 
and uh, well of course it was very cold uh, it, it was shockingly cold actually but after i warmed up i had this wellness a feeling a little bit like i had run a marathon so i could totally understand why people would do mad things like that i don't know if if you uh, can uh, talk about uh, other uh, related activities that have similar effects? Yeah, no, unfortunately, I mean, I, uh, I don't have any science uh, knowledge of either saunas or uh, cold baths, although I've, you know, experienced both a sauna and then the kind of hot cold bath, which is very invigorating, certainly, but I, I am actually not familiar with, with the, any of the brain effects. Uh, that have been studied. So unfortunately, I can't, I can't give any additional insight. Sorry about that. Maybe we'll take one more. Okay, here's one that's been on here for a while uh, from Gretchen, who says, in the exercise versus Scrabble study, why did the Scrabble players have higher pre-intervention scores? Yeah, that, you know, uh, uh, it, it was just, it was just by chance. Uh, uh, some of the scores were a little bit higher, but uh, uh, overall, uh, the, the effect was still statist statistically significant. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, uh, sorry for the people that we didn't get to. There were just a lot of questions and um, they can go to your website, wendysuzuki.com. Absolutely, yes. And we thank you so much for coming on and giving this wonderful talk and the workout routine. Okay. People can go back and check out the talk and, and pass it on to their friends. Go to the Dana Foundation's YouTube uh, channel and go to dana.org for more information on that. And of course, we're at the Secret Science Club. Thank you so much, Wendy. Okay. It's a real pleasure having you here. And uh, we hope you'll come back. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Perhaps we're more, we're more out in the wild, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you, everybody. It was so great to uh, interact with you. And thank you for coming out and, and listening to the talk and, and, and working out with me. So great to see you.